are so loved. How many of you are in love? If you're married, you better say something. <laughs> okay, come on. Are, are, are you in love? Come on. How many of you are in love? Okay. okay. You don't, I mean, you don't have to be married to be in love, right? You know, you could have a loving relationship with someone, right? Right? And, and if you're a Christian, shouldn't you be in love with Jesus, right? Shouldn't you be in love with him, right? So... Uh, the passage I'm going to be sharing with you comes from John 3, 16 through 21. And as you know, we've been studying uh, this, this year from the book of John, and our theme this year is intimacy with God, right? And now we're in chapter 3, and we're already more than halfway through the year, right? <laughs> so chapter 3, we got a long way to go. Okay, so could you, uh, Kyle, uh, pull up uh, John 3, 16 through 21 for us on the screen? Um, very familiar. How, how many of you memorized John 3.16? How many got that memorized? Okay. All right. We're going to spend the majority of our time in one verse. You like that? Okay. So we don't have a whole barrage of, you know, verses on there. We, we're going to a little bit of time, 17 through 21. But most of our time, we're going to spend on this verse alone. Okay. So why don't we just read it once? No, not let's read it twice, and then I'm going to have you all memorize it. If you don't have it memorized, we're going to make sure you memorize it, okay? So, let's read it twice, okay? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him... Ooh, this is... What version is... But have eternal life. Believeth. Who... What version is this? No, 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 let's go to NIV. NIV is new inspired version. It's better. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, can we do NIV, please? Because when we got to memorize this, everybody has to memorize the same version, okay? Do we have it? No, not yet, okay? So those, those of you who have it memorized, the NIV version, how does it go? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life, okay? All right, so that's John 3, 16. We'll have uh, Kyle pull it up again. All right. Now, who wrote John 3, 16, or who said these words? Anybody know? We know John wrote the book, the Gospel of John, but who, who said these words, John 3, 16? Jesus, God, okay, yeah, yeah. See, in the context, in the context of the story, in the beginning of chapter 3, we notice that Jesus has had a dialogue with Nicodemus, right? And then this is an extension of that dialogue, and most people assume Jesus actually said these words. But actually, more than likely, the gospel writer John wrote these as a commentary. So, so this is a kind of a commentary to what is going on, all right? John 3.16 is not the words of Christ, but is the word of God. It's found in the gospel of John. Do you have that 3.16 on? Okay, there we go. All right. For God so loved the world that he gave his only... That whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Okay, so we got it wrong. Okay, one more time. For God so loved the world that he gave this one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, my version is not even NIV. <laughs> but this is an NIV. All right. So we're going to spend some time talking about John 3, 16. Now, how many of you, how many of you, you know, I, I know some of you are really young, so you're not in a, like, a romantic love relationship. But yesterday we were at a wedding, and uh, I, I was the officiant. I, uh, you know, I, I did the premarital counseling for this couple, and I officialized the wedding. And, uh, and in, a, in a, any relationship, okay, trust me, Nathan, this is important. You've got to learn this. This is very important. You've got to start out young. All right, get this right. So, Timothy, you too, okay? This is very important. Get this down right. In any relationship, somebody always start the love. Come on. Do you guys agree? Because, like, two people meet each other. One person has to start saying, hey, I love you, and, uh, and, and, and I'm interested in you. And, and, you know, why would you love someone if you don't think that person loves you? Come on. Isn't that true, right? 
in a love relationship. You always want to make sure the other person loves you before you, you put a little bit of your heart into it. Come on. Somebody must have started. All right. Come on. So James Cho and Uni, who started the love? Come on. Somebody tell me. Who started? Was it James Cho or Uni? What? Raise your hand if you're, yeah, yeah, James Cho did it. Okay, you started. Okay, so you initiated. Somebody initiated the love, right? Now, between Bala and B, who, who started first? Bala did. Okay, see, look, look, he's, he's clear. All right, so in any relationship, somebody have to start. Somebody have to start because you could just be friends. You don't have to be in a romantic or loving relationship. You can just know each other and be acquaintances and, and be friends. There's no need to be in that deeper relationship, right? Somebody must start it. Well, in this passage, it says, For God so loved. Who started this thing? Okay, so we're clear in this, in this, in this situation, okay? That God began this relationship. For God so loved. Do you see that? He initiated. He started out. If anybody have any question about who started this loving relationship, you're going to say, God did. God did. I didn't start it because I don't even know him before he, he started loving me. I don't even know what happened and he already loved. You know, ever, have you ever been in a situation you're just like, you're loved by somebody and you don't even know it until much, much later. And you think about it and say, Man, that person loved me. Come on. You ever been in that situation? I'm not talking about Jesus only, okay? I'm talking about even in the human relationship. Sometimes you don't even know. And then I say, ah, I was loved. You ever feel that way? Okay. See, any relationship, you got to know who started the whole thing. Because some, you, you can't be confused about this kind of stuff, you know? You got to know who started it. Okay, well, at least in our relationship with God, who started the whole thing? God did. All right. So, so that, that's how it began. So who loves you? Okay, God loves you, okay? Because right here, he has an object of love. For God so loved what? The world. The, the word in Greek is cosmos, okay? For God so loved the world. The world, the world is, is, you know, think about the, the globe, right? But, but see... The people in those days, do, they do not have the cosmology that we have today. Because when we think about cosmology, what do we think about? We think about the planet Earth. Uh, what color is it? Blue color, right? The, the, the blue colored planet. Okay, back in those days, do, they do not have Hubble telescope. They, they don't know that the Earth is round, circular. So, 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 so to them, the world, they, they mean their known world, what they know of the world. Okay, and most likely in the context of this passage is referring to all the people in the world. Now, who does that include? That includes everybody. Everybody. Turn to the person next to you. That means 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 you. Everybody is included, okay? Everybody's included in this love relationship. You see, when I was looking at this passage, I'm reminded, I'm reminded in John 3 16 that the, the vows that the the bride and the groom were sharing. You know, what, what is the vow? It's the, the climax in a wedding ceremony, isn't it? The climax in a wedding ceremony. And they express their love for each other and say, hey, this is I love you, I will go through this with you, and this is what we're going to do, blah, 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 right? And that is the climax. You remember that only a, how long ago? Okay, it's been two years now, okay? Still remember what you said? Yeah? <laughs> Did you write your own vows? You did write your own, okay. Well, God wrote his own vow here, okay? He's saying, I begin the love. I want you to know I started. And I, I for, for God so loved the world, everyone here. Now, nobody is excluded here. So if anybody sitting here or anywhere else in the world that feels like, hey, nobody loves me, okay? Nobody loves me. What are you going to tell that person? Say, well, if nobody loves you, at least there's one person. Who is that? God. For God so loved the world. That means if nobody loves you, not even your parents, that's kind of sad. Parents not loving you, 
Trisha, do your parents love you? Do they, do they, you think they love you? Yeah, yeah, See, that's a good deal. So now you got at least three people. Three people love you, right? Who are these three? Dad and mom and who else? At least God, right? <laughs> at least God, okay? God loves you. So this, this vow describes for us very clearly, he began the relationship and he had a very clear object of his love. And that is everyone. Now, some theologians argue back and forth about the world. What does it mean? You know, because of their theology, they have to limit the meaning of the world. They have to limit the meaning of the world because they don't believe. If you, if you, uh, you know, if you're those people who does not believe in God, you're part of this world. See, God cannot possibly love people that don't love him. But to me, to me, I believe when the Bible says the world, he meant the world. He meant everyone. And I think God's love is unlimited. It's not selective. Just because you like me, you love me, therefore I like you, I love you back. No. I think God's love is for everyone. It's not selective. He said, I only love this half and the rest of you, I don't care. No. I mean, have you ever loved someone even though they don't love you? Come on. Or they don't know how to show love back to you. Are those of you parents feeling disappointed? Some of you are like, I don't think my kids care. Any, any of you feel that way sometimes? Have you ever been in a love relationship you feel the other person just don't care? You ever love someone like that? High school crush is like that, isn't it? What is a crush? What is a crush in high school, right? So you, you like that person, you infatuate, think about that, but that person doesn't even know you exist. <laughs> that person may not even know you exist. It's a crush. It's not real. Okay? But God loved. He loved everyone. He loved everyone. Okay? So for God so loved the world that he gave. What does it mean that he gave? He gave meant that he had an action. He did something about what he loved. If he loved someone, he did something. You know, have, have you ever been in a, in a relationship where there's just a lot of talking? You know, I love you and I'm going to, you know, love you some more. I can't stop loving you. You know, I can't love you enough. You know, all these kind of loving language. We hear enough in the songs. Come on, right? We hear a lot of love songs, you know, on the radio and you just can't hear enough of this. It's just nonstop love song, love songs. But I want to I wanna know, what are you going to do about that? You know, some people, all they care about, all they care about is hearing that people say, I love you. And they're convinced. They're convinced. But I think to be biblical, to be uh, consistent with, with what's found in the Bible, Every time the Bible talks about love, there is always corresponding action. Trust me. True love comes with action. Don't let some guy sweet talk you. Come on, girls or guys, don't do that. Don't let some girl sweet talk you. Oh, you handsome man. You know, <laughs> what? I love you, whatever. You know, just, just the talk is cheap. Say it to the person next to you, talk is cheap. And say that to your uh, husband and wife. Talk is cheap. <laughs> you know, but, but, then, but then, you know, like the wife would say, Oh, I, I did the cooking. I, I did the, the laundry. I cleaned the house. The husband said, I've been out there working all day. Blah, blah, blah. blah. Okay, yeah, they, we, do, we do prove to each other. But, you know, a lot of times we don't do it for others. We do it for ourselves. Think about that. Think about that. We do it for other people. Not really for them, but we do it for ourselves. Okay? Think, think about that. But here, God says, I love you, and he says, I'm doing something about it. Okay? And what, what did he do? He gave. He gave the ultimate price. Ultimate price. Remember, uh, well, I, I don't know, this was uh, actually uh, Pastor uh, Outer Lewis preached on this about a month ago on the... The sacrifice of Abraham, uh, to, you know, of Isaac, 
Abraham sacrificed uh, Isaac at the altar. And that was a great sacrifice, uh, sacrificing out of obedience. Now Jesus sacrificed his son out of what? Out of love. Out of love for all of us. He loved us and he gave us the greatest sacrifice. See, don't let somebody sweet talk you into think that that's, this is, they're the world around you. Don't let somebody sweet talk you. You know, you gotta say, hey, so what have you done to prove that you love me? And, and some people show them and say, ha, ah, let me give you a ring. You know, the bigger the ring represents bigger the what? Bigger the love. Is that true? Is that true? I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know. So, so, so people like to offer each other things, okay, just to express how much they love each other. But does it hurt? Does it hurt? I think what matters is, is when you give until it hurts, that's giving. If you have surplus, if you have a lot of money, and, and, and if you buying a you know, big diamond ring doesn't, doesn't hurt your wallet, I don't think it matters. Some people, you know, a small diamond ring means a lot. Just because it's, it matters, it hurts. It hurts. Okay? So just, just because you give somebody a lot, a lot of money, a lot of material kind of worth, it doesn't mean that it means a lot. It can mean very little. Does it hurt? Jesus dying on the cross, you think, what do you think happens in the Father's heart? What do you think? He was hurting. He was hurting. You know, when, when, when Jesus was dying on the cross and he says, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? What, what do you think when, and when a child is speaking to his father that, that you know, in, in, things like that? Could, could you imagine Nathan say that to you, James Cho? I mean, could you imagine that to say, why have you forsaken me? How, how do you think a father feels at the moment? That's bleeding pain. That's how it is. When Jesus, when, when, when God loved humanity, when he, he loved us so much that he gave his ultimate price. Christ of his son Jesus okay so who began this love relationship come on God began and who does he love everyone he loved everyone and then and then not only did he say I love you but he he's very clear that that he had an action he did something about it he did something to prove his love and he sent his greatest gift that he could possibly give and he gave until it hurt. Until it hurt. The Jesus on the cross. The Jesus on the cross. And uh, that there is a goal. There's a goal in this loving relationship. You know, when you're in a love relationship between a man and a woman, and uh, the man says, Hey, let me give you this diamond ring, and I want you to be my wife. Why do you think he does that for you know, when, when a man had a, get to a certain age, you know, say, I need to get married, right? I need to get married. I, I need a wife who's going to cook for me, take care of me. Right? The purpose. What is the purpose? Why does he love him? Huh? <gasps> is that what you did, Thomas? <laughs> so, so, the, so the man gives this ring to this woman so he could trap her. Yeah, little tiny little cups on the finger. <laughs> Baby cups. What is it? What does it mean when you, when you offer someone something like that? The greatest prize, something valuable, something costly. What is the point? You got to know the purpose behind it. Right? Why do you think God loves us so much? For His own good? For His own purpose? To satisfy Him? I love you so you can satisfy me. Right? Now, what does that mean? There's a lot of loving relationships in the world today, and it's all about satisfying themselves. Come on. Somebody say amen. A lot of young men tell women that they love them so they can, you know, have sex with them. That's all. That's all they care about. Relationship. 
and satisfy themselves. Here you have a relationship that's a genuinely giving relationship. What is it? What does the Bible tell us? All right. That whoso, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So that there is a twofold purpose. One is a positive and one is a negative and there's a qualifier. What is the qualifier? The qualifier is whoever believes in him. Well, earlier we talked about that this relationship is unconditional, right? God loves everyone in this world. Come on. Somebody say amen. But why do we have a qualifier? It's almost like they're putting a condition on this love. No, I can tell you that has nothing to do with understanding this verse. It makes you understand that God's love is unconditional. But why is there a qualifier all of a sudden? For the qualifier has to do with the purpose. God loves you and has a purpose in doing this. There's a qualifier for you to experience the goodness of His purpose. You have to be qualified. Okay? God's love for you is unconditional. But for you to experience it, you have to believe. Okay? You have to believe. It's just like this, you know? Let's say, uh, let's say, who, who should I use? Let's say Charlie and Susan, they're in a, they're in a loving relationship, okay? No, no, I mean, that's just one-sided, okay? Let's just say, Charlie loved Susan, okay? And Charlie wants to love Susan so much, he wants to offer her everything he's got. All right? This is such a beautiful relationship. A man wants to give her everything. But Susan says, no, I don't believe you. I don't believe you love me. And Charlie's standing there, I have so much I want to give you, but I love you, and, and you just, let me, I'll show you my heart, I'll show you my liver, I'll show you my gizzards, no, not gizzards, <laughs> I'll show you everything, but, but, but Susan said, I don't believe you, do you think they can, do you think Susan can experience the benefit of this love from Charlie? It's impossible. See, a lot of people don't get this idea, people are so confused about this idea of love. When they think about the world, you know, relationship between men and women, it's so easily understood. But then when they think about the relationship with God, they don't understand. Why? What's so hard to understand about this? It's the same thing. How can you experience the blessings, the goodness that comes in this relationship unless you believe? Don't you understand? Oh, no, I'm going to, God's going to force it on me. What kind of relationship is this? If God is so powerful, He can force His love on me. What kind of love is this when someone forces it on another person? Do you understand? We understand that in the human world. We don't like that kind of relationship. I want love to give freedom. I want love to be, to be empowering, not in the sense that somebody is badgering love on someone else. Do you understand? See, some people say, God, if you love me, you do this and that and that. But if you don't believe in Him, how can you enjoy, how can you experience? See, love is unconditional. He already gave it to you. But you have to believe to experience the benefits. Does that make sense? Yes? You got to believe. Love works that way. And sometimes, you know, between human relationship, we experience that. Father and mother want to love their children, and the children, they don't believe in this love. Do you think they can experience the benefit of that? Hardly. Hardly. It's hard for them to experience in their hearts. Love is that way. Love offers freedom. True love offers freedom. You have to believe to experience. Do you believe that? Love is not a trap. I give you a ring and you're tied down for good. <laughs> no, it's not like that. Love is empowering. Loving is setting people free. And that's what Jesus talked about. Jesus is setting us free from bondage. We're not trapped. Setting each other free. And so there is that condition for you to live out the purpose he have for you in this love. That whoever believes in him, the first part is the negative, shall not perish. But what does that mean? It means who, who's, who's going to perish? Who's going to perish? The world. The world. See, for God so loved the world. He's referring to those people in the world. 
everyone was without this love and believing in this love they're gonna perish without it they're all gonna die so what is perish the easiest definition is perish is uh, oh, perish is death people think of death as finality but I can tell you the best definition of of death is not the final thing where you close your eyes and everything turn black no that's not the best definition the best definition of death is complete separation from the loving God okay complete separation from a loving God someone who loves you so much but see if you don't understand verse uh, the beginning of verse 16 you already know that everyone on earth was already doomed to death because they've been separated from God ever since Adam and Eve and they sin and then they've been separated from God separated from the love of God so Jesus came for that very reasons to restore what love he came to restore love they the greatest separation of love is death the greatest demonstration of love is the restoration See? so the purpose of God is to take us from the eternal separation of death into a powerful redeeming relationship with his son that is what this verse is saying is what this is saying he reminds us that he started this whole thing you don't ever have to doubt because he verbalized it he made it very clear not only by his words he, he demonstrated in history and said I love you and I'm not ashamed to tell you I want you to know you're my loved object I love you I loved you since the creation of the earth and I loved you in time I loved you because you know I demonstrated in history that I sent my son to die on the cross for you 2,000 years ago and that must be clear to you not by now the only way for you to experience the benefit of the purpose of my love for you is that you have to believe you have to believe that I love you and then you can be taken from the eternal separation of love into a permanent eternal relationship with me isn't that a beautiful story isn't that a beautiful vows these are beautiful vows our Lord is giving to us today he says I love you and this is what I want to offer you think about that and then goes on from 17 through 21 and, and these are the verses basically saying the same thing he, he's trying to make a very simple point for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him whoever believes in him is not condemned but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son okay but not believing does that make us guilty no you condemned yourself because the only lifeline, lifeline that's given to you is the Son. But by believing in Him, He gives you that perfect lifeline. You understand? So a lot of people are so confused, feeling like Jesus came to condemn us. Condemn us. Jesus came and, and because of His life and death, and we're condemned. No, it's nothing. To, Jesus came to save. He came to save you. There's a restoration. Redemption is in Jesus Christ. It's not about condemnation. Jesus came not to tell you that you're a sinner because we're all sinners already. We're all doomed to go to eternal separation from God. That's hell. But Jesus came so that we can believe and we can all be caught up in heaven and have eternal life with God of this universe, the love of this universe. I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, you are loved. You are loved. And all you have to do is believe in His love. You know, I, I think the greatest pain sometimes in this world is to know the people you love does not love you back. Some of the greatest pain. You know, I, I know couples when they fight and they argue and there's so much pain. Why? Because they think that they love the other person and the other person don't love them back. You ever been in that situation? Come on, you know what I'm talking about, right? 
No? Nobody knows? Somebody say amen. amen. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. When you are, when you don't believe the other person is loving you back, there's a lot of pain that goes along with it. Okay? You know what, I, what I'm suggesting you, you guys do today? Simple. Just believe. Just believe. You know, it's a lot of time, it's hard to prove you love someone. In God, He made it so clear. It's black and white. There's no doubt from looking at the scripture that God loves us. Come on, somebody say amen. There's no doubt about God. But you know, between men and men, men and women, or between this kind of relationship between humans, a lot of times we're not sure. We're doubting. And because of that doubt, oh, there's just so much, so much hatred. There's so much anger. Rejection is so painful, my friends. It is. But the truth is, all you have to do is believe. All you have to do is believe that people meant well, even though you can't see it, because none of us can love perfectly like God. Okay? If you expect me to love, I can tell you my love is limited. My love is incomplete. I am not going to offer the same kind of love that God offers. It is impossible to demand that from me. That's not possible. So there will be imperfection in my love. God's love is perfect. And He's teaching us to believe. Just believe. Turn to the person next to you and say, just believe. Just believe. Believe can reduce a lot of the heartaches that we experience in this world. Believe. Verse 19 says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds are were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen. Go up a little bit for me, Kyle. Just a little bit more. So I can just finish verse 21. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Okay? Think about this. The light comes into the world. Who is this light? Jesus. Jesus come into the light. And, uh, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. You know, why would you reject the best blessing in this whole universe? The greatest Ah, because I don't want to change. I don't want to change my ways. I, my, I like my lazy lifestyle. I like my darkness. I, I want my sinful ways. You know, why would you want a sinful ways when you can choose the light? No, that's just how it is. That's just how the weakness is, is in, inside of us. We, out of our flesh, we have this tendency to choose weakness. My friends, you have to change for you to experience. You have to change to experience light transformation. When light comes into your life, life will be exploding with colors. Darkness has no color. But light comes into the darkness, it can make everything colorful. Do you want a life that is dull, a life that is black, hopeless or do you want a life that is colorful allow the light of life come into your life so your life can be turned into a life of light that's what Jesus came here for and for you to experience this life all you have to do is believe Um, I, I have always enjoyed the song. Uh, I believe I can fly. But you know, by, by just singing the song or reading this lyrics, you think this guy is crazy, you know. I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. I think about it every night and day. A little crazy here. A little crazy here. <laughs> but you know what? There is some truth in that. 
there's some truth in that. You gotta believe. You gotta believe. By believing at least in God's life, in this in this reality, in the spiritual reality, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can fly. Turn to the person next to you and say, you can fly. You can fly. You can touch the sky. You don't have to think about it every now and then, uh, and then, night and day, but you can just by believing, by believing in God, believing that all the benefits, all the goodness that He brings in your life, believing all the, all the blessings and gifts that comes with, with God and your faith in Him. Amen? Just believe. And so, what is the ultimate lesson today? Ultimate lesson is God is love. God is love. And nothing else we do here matters. Love is the most important thing. Love is the most important thing. Uh, it's not about Zumba or Bhangra. It's not. It's not about anything. Uh, that, that is the color that comes with it, having fun. But the most important thing is love. If we don't talk about love, what do we talk about here? Okay, so why don't we just close our eyes and just come before the Lord one more time.